everyone seems to have all the rebel guys seem to have a really good story like a first sort of interaction with helmet i i can see a grin there already yuri come on you gotta got tell us now man you gotta come on tell us tell us yeah. how things are okay. all right so Hello and welcome to the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and in the words of an ex-race director, we went car racing. Yes, F2 and F3 had their first competitive outing this year with new drivers and new teams, and we're going to go through both in this very podcast as we debrief over a frantic opening weekend with the help of some very special guests. I'm delighted to say that we have high-tech driver, Red Bull junior team member, and the man who deserved the F2 feature race win in Bahrain, Yuri Vips. Has a sleep let the frustration subside a little bit, Yuri? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the best thing is just to not dwell on it and let it go. I mean, it's in the past now, and yeah, we have another race coming so uh, next weekend, so we can just yeah move on and have another chance of redemption. Absolutely. I'll hear all about that and the rest of the F2 races. Uh, and in case you thought the F2 would get all the attention this week, we also have Van Amersfoort driver, pole sitter, and one of F3's impressive new stable of rookies, Franco Colapinto is joining us. Not a bad way to start your time in a new series, Franco. Has the adrenaline set down? <laughs> yeah, man. Just arrived from Bahrain and uh, really happy about the weekend. Yeah. Of course, it was a little bit more than what I was expecting, and I think as well the team. Uh, but it was a really positive weekend for us. We showed the speed of the team, we showed the speed of the car. And, and yeah, I think it was a really, really good start, really promising for the for the next few races, and already, already looking forward for Imola. Well, you certainly looked like you were uh, in the right place in Formula 3. You didn't look at any point like you weren't meant to be there. So congratulations. And again, we'll hear all about what's happened in both F3 races. And last but not least, delighted to welcome back F1 Feed Series F2 editor, Tyler Foster. I know that you love every child equally in the junior single-seater world, but was it a little bit more special seeing F2 and F3 this weekend, Tyler? Yeah, definitely. Um, I covered FRAC uh, in the winter series and it was fun to see cars back out on track, but nothing beats F2 and F3 when it comes to the feeder series. And, you know, we've got two of the best guys here with us today that are going to have a bit of a chat about how things went in Bayern, which is a great circuit to have that first round back. So, yeah, really happy to see those cars back out. Yeah, two drivers who both uh, enjoyed their time at the front of the grid. Uh, so really excited to hear how, uh, how it went from your guys' perspectives. But before we get into everything, a quick reminder to like, comment and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're old school and listening to the audio-only version, please leave a review on whatever podcast platform you're using. It really does help us out. Let's start with Formula 2. It was frantic, it was fun, it was unexpected, it was typical Formula 2, I suppose. Yuri, you, <laughs> you did so well, you really did, and I'm sure everyone listening or watching will appreciate that you probably deserved the win, if not for situation outside of your hands. How did you view the whole, the whole weekend and how did you view the Sunday? Oh, yeah, I mean, we're ridiculously fast all weekend, but... It's just, yeah, it's a bit of a shame because we didn't really capitalize and I never really like when we don't get the maximum out of everything during the weekend. But, um, I mean, still, it's not terrible how we finished up, but it's just, yeah, sort of like mixed feelings because I'm happy with the pace. But then again, you know, we didn't really maximize anything. So, yeah. Are you encouraged by high techs? Um I will not call it progress because high tech were really quick last year as well. But unfortunate, are you encouraged by how well you've started the season? Because it does look like you're a serious contender at the top. Ah, uh, definitely. But I mean, with high tech last year, at least we sort of struggled more with the smoother and higher speed circuits, which is exactly like Saudi. So we are now going to change the car quite a lot for that, and hopefully it will all work. But let's see. Like Bahrain, we last year you couldn't see because I had ridiculous luck. Uh, 
like way worse than this weekend. Um, but we were actually really fast in Bahrain all weekend. So, um, yeah, for sure we took a step forward this weekend and especially in the feature race, it was crazy how fast we were. But yeah, um, it is encouraging, but I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to how we're getting on in Saudi because it will give a good indication for the rest of the year for circuits like Silverstone and Imola and a lot of these European tracks. Tyler, we've got Yuri encouraged by it. I think it'd be fair to say you are as well. Did you see anyone else on the grid that was really impressive this year? Because it looked like a lot of the second year drivers had it in the bag, but then some of the rookies started to show their quality as well. Yeah, I mean, qualifying was interesting. Um, I mean, someone ended up in the gravel trap you know, after turn two on the first lap in the Yuma Owasa, who, you know, another Red Bull junior who had actually had a really good weekend in the end, which was one of those ones where it will be nice for him because he got, you know, he's shown the pace that that car has and that he has, but ultimately he only got one point out of it. Um, on the flip side, someone who is also a rookie in F2 this year, but someone who's probably expected to fight for the title with guys like Yuri, Jack Doohan obviously got pole really, really strong with Virtuosi and then, it's one of those really horrible ones where it's it, it is his mistake that he made, but it, he's coming out with you know the pits on cold tires and he just tags Porsche and you know with your wing it like that, even if it doesn't really have much of an effect in terms of the the downforce, it's a danger and you've got to come in. So yeah, it, there was a lot of a lot of drivers that had their weekends go wrong because of one or two small things, and um, in the end, the guys that finished on the podium in the feature race and and Yuri, Porsche and Lawson are all guys that at the beginning of the year you would have probably put as, as favourites for the title. So it was weird how it worked out. But um, yeah, there was a, a, lot of, a lot of interesting happenings on track. Yuri, did you view the move back to having just two races taking a lot of jeopardy? Did it take, did it take a lot of jeopardy out of that first race? Did you feel you were a lot freer to go racing properly and put your foot down? A hundred percent, because like, if you crash in the first race last year, you just like, you ruin your weekend, you know, because you're starting last for the second one as well. And yeah, it was just like, you know, it's kind of a sprint race, but it's not really as well, because you're not really attacking as much as you used to, um, because there's sort of added pressure of finishing the race, but what within top 10. Um, So yeah, it was definitely much better, this format. Um, You can just go flat out and... uh, you know, can see some proper racing as well like that. It's not like we struggle for proper racing, but yeah, I completely understand what you mean. And Franco, I know you were busy with your own racing, but how did you enjoy watching Formula 2 trackside, presumably, when you were actually there? Oh yeah, man, it's amazing, you know, to be already in the F1 weekend with F1, F2 and F3. Uh, It's really nice to to be there in the meantime, watching the, the F2 guys, uh, how professional they are and, and you know it's like the next step after F3 and it's what every driver of F3 is trying to achieve in their next few seasons uh, so it's really nice to be there try to learn a bit from from the teams look at the pit stops look at the things that uh, that are different compared to F3 um, and yeah it's really cool to be, to be here uh, honestly I really enjoy the weekend and I hope to to keep doing it in the in the next few rounds did Van Amersfoort allow you to get closer to the F2 uh, pits, the F2 drivers, the F2 engineers to really enhance your your understanding for your probable future? Uh, yeah, you know, it was, it was nice to be there. Uh, there is a lot of people helping us because uh, we are all new here. Uh, the team is new. Uh, even the people in, in F2, I mean, they have a lot of experience. Uh, kind of drivers like Jake, Jake Hughes in F2 is helping us quite a lot because uh, I quite rate him as a driver in F3. He, he, he did some really, really, really good stuff there. And he's been helping us in, in some things that we are missing, some bits that we didn't saw before. Uh, and I think it's really useful, you know, to, to work as a team there as well, even if we are not in the same uh, in the same championship, it's uh, good to help each other in, in the things we can. Yeah, and Hugh's taking some points in that uh, second race as well. Really encouraging. Yuri, you've got to go into this season thinking of the championship. One, is that a correct assumption? <laughs> and two, who are you viewing as your main championship contenders? 
Um, I think in the end it will be the premise. Um, like, yeah, it's I. <sighs> You know, uh, there's not much to change in the regulations or anything from last year. And uh, yeah, I think once we arrive at Saudi, Imola and all the European tracks uh, from now on, we will see them. I think they were fast this weekend as well, but uh, they just didn't deliver. The, they didn't put the weekend together. Um, there's some strange strategies going on in quali that I didn't quite understand what they did. But And Chehan had a bit of a messy lap as well. But yeah, and Haug was obviously a rookie and it's not easy coming in, um, I guess. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they will be in the end uh, the ones to beat. But uh, yeah, I think the Carlin duo, Boucher, Duhan, um, maybe Drogovic is what I would say. I think yeah. they're going to be the main. And Drogovic seemed to have a bit of a resurgence back at MP, Tyler. Are we going to see him claiming some wins this year? Well, he's had a bit of a weird time in Formula 2 because obviously he started with MP. Went to Virtuosi for last year, who, you know, are a very strong team, as we saw with Doohan getting pole. And he didn't win a race, even though he did with MP. So he's gone back to the team that he feels more comfortable with, which for some drivers is, you know, it's, it's a thing. Um, you know, Armstrong, Yuri's teammate, has gone back to, to high tech. And I spoke to him earlier this year and he said that he feels that that's home to him. So it seems like, uh, and same for Daruga as well, gone back to Prima, which he was with the F3. So it's a lot of a lot of drivers switching to different teams, but um but yeah, I think that uh, ultimately, um, in terms of the, the championship, I think that, I, I mean, I know what you're saying. At the beginning of the year, I thought the Premiers were going to be really strong as well. But I, I, I mean, it did seem like they were off the pace in terms of um, they weren't at the same level of preparation, I think, coming into the season. And I, I know that obviously the regulations aren't different. So you expect them to certainly catch up uh, soon, if not by the next round. But um, I think the pace of the guys at the front was so strong. Um, and there are so many good contenders. You know, you've got guys like Boschon, who, you know, is yes, he's in his third or fourth season now in, in, in F2, but, you know, he's a driver who showed a lot of pace as well. So um, it could be really difficult for, for Prima. I think Daruvula has a chance. I think Halga might have to wait until next year to get his chance at the title. Though. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating to watch and one of the big reasons why we're all watching Formula 2 with such such a strong field this year. You mentioned Boshong, who sniffed at a podium, fourth place twice. Uh, certain um, Estonian kind of prevented that with Yuri's uh, terrific time. Is that the first of many podiums that you're going to have this year, do you think, Yuri? First of many? Well, I hope so, yeah. I mean, podiums, they don't really, it's, it's the winning that matters. But uh, yeah, hopefully podiums too. But are you thinking this year that you've got some specific tracks? Because you mentioned the ones you're weaker at, but you've got ones that you are thinking definitely going to go and dominate this weekend. You did so well last year at Baku, for example. I can't imagine us being off the pace in like Monaco and Baku. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously we, we had some weaker tracks and stronger tracks last year. But I think what you were saying before, that they weren't too prepared uh, with the Ruval and Hauger, I think you will... Uh, I think there was a bit masks this weekend, um, Prima's real pace. Because it also last year, like all these bumpier, slow speed tracks, they were always competitive. They were always up there, but they weren't sort of in a different league. You want, when you watch some of Piastri's onboard laps, they just have more grip than, <laughs> than anyone else. So, yeah, it was, uh, I think you will see the real Prima next weekend. Yeah, can I just, I just want to ask Yuri um, two things. First of all, in terms of Bahrain, obviously the F3 guys don't do it, but you get to race in the day and in the night. Obviously, in terms of the tyres, Bahrain's always a, a really interesting one when it comes to the degradation there. Do you prefer to race in the day where you've got you know more hotter temperatures and then more deg degradation, maybe uh, more of an unknown, or in the night when it's obviously maybe a bit more of a spectacle to watch for fans? I really enjoy the night race because I just it's really cool, I think. Um, I don't know. It's just a different kind of feeling to, to racing in the night. Um, I really like it personally, but I think if I, after this weekend, uh, I would choose the day because we were ridiculously fast in the, in the feature race. And yeah, I would, I would, we changed the car quite a bit as well, but um, we don't know if it would have worked at the night, to be honest. But yeah, during the day, we were really fast. So I would choose the, in Bahrain, I would choose the day, day race. Formula 3 also back in action, and it started with a pole position that 
very few people saw coming, but one of our guests might have. How did it go from your point of view, Franca? Yeah, actually, from my point of view, I didn't saw it coming neither. So it was <laughs> quite a surprise uh, <laughs> for the team as well. But yeah, was uh, I just managed to put a, a good lap together in all the sectors. In the same lap, it was really difficult, actually, because I had two truck limits in the laps before. So I had no laps in until uh, my last set of tires and the first push is the one that matters. So it was kind of, uh, you know, trying to be safe, but trying to, to push to be up the front. Uh, so it was really difficult to manage. But luckily, we were on pole and luckily we showed the, I think, the great car we had for Quali. Uh, also, the conditions changed quite a lot compared to free practice. I think the pace more or less improved by two seconds. So it was a bit of an unknown how the car was going to respond after the F1 rubber, F2 rubber. Um, and of course, the truck was quite dirty when we went out for FP1. So, uh, you know, that's what F3 has that is quite uh, surprising. You go to quali without knowing what's going to happen, without knowing who who is the real, the real threat. Uh, and I think this is really cool for quali of F3. Well, nobody would have seen Van Amersfoort going in there on their very first appearance with a rookie driver to do so, so well. So massive congratulations to you. It didn't all come together during the race, but you're still quite impressive. How did you find, well, let's talk about the feature race primarily, where you were leading for so long. How did you enjoy the racing? Oh, yeah, so much. You know, it's uh, amazing to be here in our first weekend together, first few days working with engineers, with the mechanics, uh, people that I knew from before, and we only had a few days testing uh, here in Bahrain for, you know, to know a bit better each other, to know the car. Uh, and I think that was the biggest surprise for me uh, to adapt so quick uh, to a new championship, to a new car, to such a difficult championship. So the gaps are so tight all the Teams are so competitive. Um, and I think the race was pretty good for what I was expecting. I knew uh, we didn't have the pace that Prema and ART had, definitely. And Prema, I think, was in another level, definitely, in the in the future race even more. Starting from P14 or 13, mm. going up to P2, uh, their gap was so, so, so big compared to what we had in the race. So I think we maximized the package we had this weekend. Uh, of course, in the end, that truck limits penalty was just a kind of miscommunication. Uh, I didn't really know any warnings I had before, and I only I only knew I got the penalty. So in the end, I was not able to uh, kind of manage it. Uh, it was a pity to, to lose the podium because of that. Um, but it's still a really positive weekend. It's still a lot more than what we were expecting. So I'm really, really proud, honestly of all the team, really grateful for the opportunity I got this year to, to race in F3. This is what uh, we were expecting since a few years ago. Uh, and I'm really, just, you know, uh, with a lot of... Uh, I want more, honestly. I want more <laughs> and I want to keep pushing for more good results like this. Well, I'm sure you're going to... Uh, we're going to see you on the podium and maybe even take a few more pole positions if this weekend is anything to go by. You mentioned... The track limits. Yuri, it's been a hot topic, especially this time last year with Formula One in Bahrain as well, the track limits in particular at Turn 4. Did you notice anything different going into this race this year with what sort of information you were giving about how the track limits would be enforced for both this year and this race? Uh, yeah, so basically, it's just a different approach they have. They told us at the briefing that it's just going to be very strict and straightforward. So, um, yeah, if you go over, then it's track limits and lap time deleted in quality and uh, in the races, you might get a penalty after a couple of times. So, not you might, you will get a penalty after a couple of times. So, but surely yeah. this is uh, what they said last year. What's changed for 2022? No. no. So, last year, generally, the approach uh, in previous years has always been like, you know, like we will interpret it, so on and so on. Uh, during free, it was always very great. Like, you know, you could come to a weekend and uh, say, okay, we will monitor the situation during free practice. 
uh, we had a lot of those conversations on all the briefings and uh, yeah, they're just, I, I, I quite like this approach. It's just very clear and uh, everyone sort of knows what to do. What blows my mind a little bit, it wasn't so black and white uh, last year, but no, great, great insight. Thank you, Yuri. Tyler, Franco clearly did extremely well, but was there any other drivers, maybe some of the rookies, but maybe some of the returnees who really impressed you for Formula 3 in this opening round? Yeah, well, the, we talked about the Formula 2 grid being uh, quite packed in terms of championship contenders. Formula 3, I think, probably is even more. Uh, you've got guys like Victor Martins and Leclerc, obviously, who you know, probably maybe a surprise that they maybe didn't make the jump up to F2 for this year. Guys like Oli Behrman as well. Uh, it's nice to see Juan Manuel Correa uh, getting the points for both races as well. Um, you know, obviously after his horrible accident uh, years back. Um, obviously, Franco. I mean, I think the surprise was not just the fact that um, you've got such talented drivers who are, are returning and obviously Franco's in his first year, but more importantly that it's VAR. You know, and having a new team come in Yes, they are very good in, in the further down junior series, but it's a different thing altogether coming into F3 and F2. So it, I think that was the most impressive thing that they... Uh, and Jake Hughes as well, He even in F2, he looked quite quick in, in qualifying, didn't obviously pan out as much in the races. But So hopefully VAR will be uh, a strong team to contend with in, in F3 because, yeah, that looked really impressive. Franco, we can continue to inflate your ego. So maybe let's try and deflate it by having to put some praise on some other drivers elsewhere. You were racing against these guys. Victor took the lead, took the win. But did you see anybody else on track or when you watched any, any replays who really impressed you from your opening ground in Bahrain? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of the rookies, uh, you know, kind of guys like Berman, Sossi, they were really good during the weekend. I think they were really strong compared to their own teammates. So uh, to be, of course, the first uh, race week of in F3 and for all the rookies, it's quite difficult, you know, to just go into quality with two push-ups in, in free practice. Um, and it's, I think, the biggest difference that the guys with more experience are doing uh, where they can make a bigger gap compared to us. So uh, I think it's just... You know, these drivers like Sossi that he, for example, showed last year how strong he was in, in Formula Regional or Behrman in F4. And he's in a really, really good team, really su successful team. So I think they will be all really quick. Uh, I'm pretty sure they will be fighting for the for the championship with the more experienced drivers even. So, um, yeah, only I would say that VAR, you know, it's a new team. They showed in F3 and in F2 how strong we are already. Uh, we have to keep working to to start to get a bit more close, you know, to Prema, to ART. They are at the moment the strongest, as we could see in Bahrain. But yeah, there is a lot of work to do, but I think we can get there slowly. Well, I can take it from us watching from the sidelines that it's uh, much preferable to your predecessors who weren't as on the pace the last few years. Yuri, one driver, you may want to get some uh, bonus points from your employers who they've not mentioned. Isaac Hadjar did pretty well as well this uh, this race weekend. Was anybody else as well as Hadjar who seemed to shine brightly in Formula 3? Uh, yeah, Hadjar was strong. I mean, even in testing, it was, it was quite impressive because I think he's quite young. I think he's like 17 or something, so... Yeah, was uh, was fastest in testing, uh, fastest also on the race pace. Um, yeah, he, I mean, he won the first race and yeah, had a great pace there. And then it was just, yeah, I think he damaged his front wing or something in the feature race. Or he, no, he got a puncture. Sorry. Yeah, so he was strong. Um, I was happy to see Juan up there. He had a bit of a difficult season last year, but uh, yeah, I'm good mates with him. So I was happy to see him do well this weekend um yeah one thing that stood out was the primal race pace it was like crazy <laughs> in the future race it yeah. looked ridiculous how like because not just the clerk i mean the clerk obviously started like i think what like 12 13th or something 14th yeah yeah 14th yeah. yeah so i mean i think he gained a couple of positions on the first laps as well but like i think after the first couple of laps Behrman and Crawford, they were like 13th and 16th or something. And then they 
just came through as well to like six and eighth and uh, I could see them like fighting and destroying their tires so it seemed that they nothing has not much has changed since I've left um so yeah um that was that was pretty interesting to watch and yeah I mean it was it was good races like um both races were quite interesting there was a lot of overtaking and stuff and yeah my uh, my sympathies go out to Harry Benjamin going in to commentate for the first time solo because it was frantic, those first opening laps on both. Um, but, Franco, you're the only driver in the feature race in the top seven who doesn't drive for Prema or ART. So I think that's a real sign of intent, that how, how good you've done. I'm fascinated to see if the team's championship is going to be as hard fought as it was last year with Kramer and Trident fighting to the bitter end. So Formula 3 is back, Formula 2 back, and I couldn't be happier. As much as we could ask questions about both all day, F1 Feeder Series isn't for us, it's for you, and we want to make sure you all feel involved. So we're moving on to the part of the podcast where our viewers and listeners have their say with hashtag AskF1FS. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag, hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the podcast questions channel, or simply commenting on our YouTube videos and asking whatever it is that's on your mind. Now, Yuri, this may break some girls' hearts, but you've got to take your girlfriend off to the airport fairly soon, I understand. So I'm going to start with you. Tyler Franco, if you want to jump in, please feel free to, but uh, I just want to make sure Yuri doesn't end up in the doghouse. So we're going to focus on... I still got a bit of time, I think. Okay, well, well, let's start with you nonetheless, uh, just to make sure that you are going to stay in a relationship. This question comes from Law, and it says, Yuri, since you were teammates with Marcus a few years ago in F4, is your relationship as teammates going to be different this year than it was back then? And if yes, how so? Nothing's changed. To be honest, we've been like good mates throughout all the time that we were in teammates. So, I mean, we race together every year, apart from 2020, where well, I actually did a couple races. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I sat most of the year out, but Every other year we've been we've been racing together. So yeah. He's moved to London as well, so he's not too far from me. You're quite friendly with a lot of the drivers, right? That you've uh, you get on well with Jayhan, for example, as well. Is it just something about your persona, do you think, that you welcome the friendliness? Just a very nice person. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Like, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of those guys I've just come through all the categories with and I don't know. Yeah. Like some of them, have just like kind of developed some kind of we. I don't know if you can. It's kind of a friendship, but it's kind of weird also because you know you're racing each other, and when the helmets are on, you're not really friends. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm friendly with. Does it help being in the Red Bull uh, yeah. Junior team? Like obviously they have so many guys at this level, especially in F2. Um, I know you're speaking to Liam in the press conference yesterday, and obviously not your teammate anymore, but still good friends with him as well. So I just wondered if that Red Bull affiliation has an effect on friendships, maybe. Or, you know, uh, maybe. Definitely, but there's so many of us now. I Like, when, when the new ones get signed, I sometimes, like, I take, like, you know, I sometimes realise a few months into the season that, oh, yeah, is this guy Red Bull? <laughs> like, it's, <laughs> yeah. you know, but Liam's a different case. He's literally, like, my neighbour. So we live in, like, the same apartment complex, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I see from, him a fair bit. As from Drive to Survive, were you uh, not roped in to do some moving for <laughs> Yuki Sonoda last year? I don't know if I was there or not, but yeah, Yuki was Yuki was there with us as well. That's yeah, <laughs> before he got kicked out, but uh, yeah, <laughs> no, it's good fun there. Oh, it's yeah. fun here. Drive to Survive. Have you watched it? I did actually, yeah. I thought the only episode that was really cool was the one with Yuki. Yeah, was... He's just like, he's just a different, yeah, I don't know. His mind operates in a very different way to most people. <laughs> it's fun. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> well, I think it can be a good thing as well, I think, but it's just, it's very unique. It's yeah, very that's unique. True. Yeah. We know on the radio that he's very unique, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said he's working on that, but. Yeah, 
He has been a bit better in the last part of the season, but let's see. Just a question that kind of falls off the back of that, actually, that you, you're friends with Yuki, the Red Bull guys, but does it, does it become quite awkward when conversation does turn to moving to F1? Because you'll want to steal his seat. You want to make sure that Jayhan doesn't get there. You want to look out for yourself while also maintaining friendships. But listen, like we all know the position we're in, we're sort of matured, mature enough to sort of know where we are and that we are fighting each other for, for this, our futures essentially. And uh, it's just, I guess, yeah, we, we never really talk about it with them. Um, mm -hmm. To be honest, we talk about racing stuff, but we don't, you know, it's some stuff that, you know, never really comes up in conversations, but so that's why I'm saying that it's kind of like a weird sort of friendship that we all have, you know. Mm. But okay. has it changed slightly with uh, Jack moving to Alpine, or did you not really notice any difference in terms of your relationship with him? I understand you've been doing some stuff the last few days. We don't do a lot of stuff together, actually, with all the Red Bull Juniors. So it's just uh, basically me and Liam now that are living in Milton Keynes. Uh, Yuki used to be as well, but. Yeah, I mean, Jayhan, I've obviously known forever since uh, we've raced together since F3. So, yeah. And he lives also nearby in, in London. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, a few of them, you know, but like the other juniors, you see them maybe if you're in different sims uh, on the same day you see them. But uh, otherwise, it's just at the racetracks, really. Mm. Understood. Well, the next question sticks with the Red Bull theme. And it's from Ice Frost and wants to know how the team dynamics are with Max and Checo and that they loved seeing you interacting with them on the latest Red Bull podcast. Are you cheating on us with other podcasts, Yuri? <laughs> no, the Red Bull one was actually the first one I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, yeah, I mean, they told me I did well, but then I listened to it and I, I was just like, well, I basically had to ask questions, but then they would answer like, and I would just be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so... It was a bit weird before when I was just sitting back listening to myself, but yeah. Wait, sorry, what was the original question? <laughs> I was going to say, you get used to it, but the original question is how were the team dynamics with Max and Checo? Yeah, I mean, at the moment, it's all working really well. Um, Checo obviously has brought a lot, a lot of experience to the team with, you know, all the teams he's been in the past. And, uh, you know, you always learn something from other drivers coming into the team. Um with, you know, experience from previous teams. Even though, know, okay, Red Bull is sort of the benchmark in F1, but uh, still, you know, there's things to take away. And uh, yeah, um, so yeah, he's been, he's been great for the team. And obviously, yeah, Max is, is, uh, is sort of a once in a generation kind of, kind of talent that uh, is, yeah, just signed his ridiculous contract. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, I don't need to tell everyone how valuable he is. Is he valuable for you uh, as a junior driver? Is there like any sort of access that you have speaking to him? Yeah, very. Um, well, I was obviously talking to him a lot, but not so much about, you know, to help myself, but because I did like, I do most of the development work for, for the F1 team in the simulator. So that's mainly like what we're talking about. But obviously like, I did four races as a reserve end of 2020 as well. And even just now being there on the test, you, you learn, you pick up little things here and there sort of sitting in, in the meetings. You can tell from some of the photos, actually, you guys just seem to be quite open conversational in the garage. So yeah, great to see. Let's move on because a bunch of questions for both of you guys. This one's from Dan, who I need to, <laughs> I need to also shout out his Twitter handle, which is Vip Stappen. So I think he's got a, a good joining together of two drivers there. Yuri, how excited are you to drive the RB18 and the FP1s this season? If all goes to plan, you'll hopefully be driving Grand Effect cars full-time next year with a winky emoji. Well, thanks for letting me know that I'm driving FP1s this year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, yeah, uh, let's see. I mean... Uh, I might, I might not. Let's see. Let's see how the season goes. Um, but yeah, obviously, if it happens, it'll be, it'll be unbelievable. 
That's interesting. I had heard that you were, or I'd read rumours apparently, that you were going to be driving some. Is it something that you guys get told well in advance or is it, hey, you're up next weekend? Very last minute. The first um, F1 test I ever did, so basically it was to get my super license. You had to do like 300 kilometers in an old mm. car. And I was in Japan and I missed out already on half of my season. And I basically get a call that, okay, come to Europe uh, from Helmut. That, okay, fly to Europe. Uh, in two days you have a seat fit and in three days you're driving uh, the, what was it, the 2012 F1 car in Silverstone for the 300 kilometer test. So it's Helmut likes everything very last minute. He doesn't really want you to be, you know, you to, for yourself to sort of like prepare everything in your mind. He likes to sort of... Uh, throw you in uh, in deep, deep waters, so to say, um, mm -hmm. which, I mean, I don't want to question his methods because almost half the grid is ex-rebel drivers. So, you know, it's clearly working what he's doing. Yeah, and the, the current champion's done all right as well. Um, speaking of that, though, is it Halmut who actually just calls you up? It's direct line to Halmut Marco, not a PA, not an assistant, or anything like that, who just says Halmut wants you. It's direct Halmut Marco calls you flyover yeah 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 it's, it's just like that yeah <laughs> i just want to say it's uh you know, everyone seems to have all the rebel guys seem to have a really good story like a first sort of interaction with helmet i i can see a grin there already yuri come on you gotta, you gotta tell us now man you gotta come on man. tell us tell us yeah. how things are okay. all right so i mean uh... <laughs> Okay, like he likes putting people under pressure, yeah? Like, especially at the beginning when you join. So, basically, my first ever sim session in Rebel, it was, I've only done, like, two days of simulator in my whole life, like any simulator. And surprise, surprise, I suck. And the next day, I guess Helmut got the report or something. And, um, yeah, I basically get a phone call the next day saying, like, okay, you're shit, you need to, if you don't improve, I'm going to kick you out. I haven't even done a race for them, you know, just a simulator session. So yeah, it was a nice introduction. Did you, did you <laughs> have to book your ideas up? Did you, did it work? I mean, yeah, but I, I, I kind of knew that he was just intimidating me and, you know, I, I was smart enough to know that he wasn't actually going to, you know, kick me out based on a bad simulator session. He knew that it was on track that sort of matters, but he likes to put us under pressure if we do bad and not just on track, but anything we do off track as well. Well, hopefully this podcast isn't adding too much pressure to you that he's going to judge you on. Um, you'll have pressure on this question to give a one word answer though. This one comes from F1 Oholic and wants to know for Yuri, your race was really good yesterday, so much pace. So congratulate to start with, but which track in F2 would mean the most to you if you won at it? 25 points for each race. So, I don't know. <laughs> What's the driver's uh, answer? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, 25 feature race, but sprint race, it doesn't really matter if you win it. I don't really consider them victories. Um, I don't know. To be honest, maybe Monaco would be cool, but uh, like, I don't know if I'd be happy if I won in Monaco than I did in anywhere else, to be honest. So I'm not sure. Like, it's just, I don't know, the sort of prestige around that maybe, but I'm not sure if I actually won, if I'd be happier than if I won any other race. Very pragmatic answer. This one comes to both of you, actually. And at this point, you're, if you do need to shoot off, please just wave goodbye and uh, we'll see you next time. But this one comes from uh, Fossey King via Discord. He wants to know what are the driver's views on alternatives to the conventional F3, F2, F1 route? Obviously, Franco was in European Le Mans and Yuri was supposed to do Super Formula and Yuri's uh, teammate, Liam Lawson, did DTM. So let's go with you, Franco, because you've been quiet for a little while. Not the normal ladder approach. How, how do you view this in terms of gaining experience, I guess? Yeah, you know, it's completely different uh, to go into endurance racing. It's just quite tough for me last year because uh, there is a lot of things to learn. Uh, you have to really, really mature uh, 
you have a lot of stuff uh, that is really different than the sprint races like in formula um there is a lot of stuff that i never did before that i started to do there so uh, it was a process uh, i think and at the end of the year i got quite good at endurance but uh, I struggle at some moments of, of 2021. Um, of course, Le Mans for me, I think was the biggest race I did so far. And it was just amazing, you know, the, the, the amount of experience, amount of emotions you go through in, in only 24 hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was an experience that I, I think I would never forget about it because uh, so many things that happened, so many things like, I mean, good and bad, but, just from one second to another, everything was changing. Uh, and it's just uh, incredible to be there uh, and, and feel what, what the team feels, what, what's happening when another one, another driver is in the car, uh, when the, the weather starts to change, when the strategy starts to become a bit tricky. So it's like completely different than formula racing. Uh, but of course, after a year in endurance, I, I just thought, uh, it's it's not really my thing. I really like it, but I prefer to be uh, the one driving the car. I prefer to be only one. And I want to have because there are there are a lot of factors in endurance. Of course, there are three drivers in the car and a big team behind, and a lot of factors matter in the in the final result. Uh, some that you can control, some that you cannot, um, and more that you cannot than the ones that you can. So that's the part that I didn't like so much and and you know it gave me so much experience for for this season i think i did uh, a lot of kilometers last year in lmp2 and uh, i guess it will help me a lot for f3 uh, i think i took really really good things from there um, and yeah i hope uh, maybe i can still do it in the future you know it's it's just a, a opportunity that is still open in in case uh, Someday I stop in Formula cars, uh, but at the moment I'm really focusing in F3 and and I'm really, you know, uh, looking forward to to keep doing the, uh, well during the season and, and and have some good races. Yeah, well, you've clearly got some level to tell people this is how good I am. Yuri, you, <laughs> well, year 2000 didn't go to plan, but nobody's did but yours in particular seemed to be a bit more troublesome had it gone ahead the way it should have do you think that would have helped or was it not what you would have really intended to do with the f2 f what f3 f2 f1 ladder um i think it would have definitely helped to be honest i really really like japan from well i didn't get to spend a lot of or well, actually spent a lot of time but i didn't get a lot of track time there uh, I got stuck in Japan actually for like two months, but um, yeah, like the cars are unbelievable there. They're so much faster than F2 and yeah, I think it's actually a very relevant championship for F1 because I mean, in the high speed corners, no, maybe the downforce is not on the exactly same level as F1 cars, but it's very close, but the tire is also working really well in high speed corners. So like Suzuka, we're not really off like we're not much lower than f1 cars and the, like high speed corners so yeah i think it's like i think it's a very relevant championship and it would have been great to do it and especially it's like a massive challenge for european drivers because it's just something so different that like you know in europe everyone sort of knows the tracks and everything and if you have someone like coming from i don't know usa or japan or wherever else um to race in f3 or f2 they're going to struggle because they don't know the tracks or anything but my teammate was like 33, I think, and like 12th year of Super Formula, something crazy like that. So like he knew the tracks in and out and I would just have to sort of jump in every weekend and kind of deliver learning new tracks. Um, so I think that could have been quite, quite a cool experience, but yeah, sadly missed out. Just, just wanted to ask, oh, sorry, I just wanted to ask you about the interesting about the Super Formula car, about the sort of comparison you made to F1. Um, a lot of the F2 guys who came from F3 last year were saying that the, the step up's not actually as big as fans might expect it to be. In terms of the next generation of maybe the junior cars, so Formula 2, for example, do you think the gap between Formula 3, Formula 2 and Formula 1 should be addressed? Because it seems like 
Formula 3 and Formula 2 are quite close and there's a big step to Formula 1. Do you think it should be a bit more even? 100%. No, I agree with you. But the thing is, like, actually the, the Super Formula is the same chassis as the Formula 2 car, but it's like 120 kilos lighter, if I'm not wrong. So it's just that the, the engine and the gearbox is much sort of more sophisticated and much better, like compact uh, compared to the F2 car, because that's most of the weight in the car. Um, so that's what makes it so so fast and so, and so nimble. Um, but yeah, no, definitely there's a massive gap. Like I think at least on testing where we began, I, a lot of the top F3 guys were faster over a race run than the slower F2 guys. So uh-huh. especially over the race pace, it was... Uh, it's very evident because, yeah, I mean, I think around Barcelona, we're like 13 seconds off F1 over one lap mm. or 14 seconds or something. But if you take Super Formula, for example, in Suzuka, which is a longer track, we're only like seven seven seconds off pole. So it's a lot faster and more relevant car. So I think F2, I think F3 is fine where it is, but F2 should push more towards that direction without somehow raising the cost too much because that's also a big issue. We're all valid points there. Um, and it didn't do too badly for Pierre Gasly going off to Japan either. So it's at least something, <laughs> something helps. We're going to go and concentrate on your questions here, Franco. Um, a lot of attention. You've got a lot of people back home very excited about how well you've done. Matthias Frontini wants to know how much your social media changed after your poll. A lot of people saw you in the news and we all know how passionate the Argentinians are. <laughs> yeah, mate. I mean, you know, so many years without a uh, Argentinian driver in in F three or in F two or in, in any championship, let's say that is in the in the way to Formula One. Of course, it's like such a long way there. But uh, you know, the Argentinians have, I think, not really a lot of drivers in Europe. I think I'm one of the only ones this year. So it's like if someone is doing well from their country, it's like is all the attention focusing in him and it's more or less what is happening now because uh, there's not really any other Argentinian racing driver uh, where I am right now. So, yeah, it's quite a special moment for me and I'm really enjoying it. You know, the, the support from from my country, it's been uh, unbelievable the last few days. And and I think it's really, it's really nice to have this, you know, it's pushing me to... To, to keep working, to keep delivering the results. Uh, and you could really feel the, the effects from home, uh, from so far. I mean, I've been, I've been living in Europe for a few years already, but I'm still going there, uh, you know, to spend time with my family, with my friends. And, and it's really nice to, to have this feeling of, like, feeling them a bit closer than what they normally are um, with all this news and... and and you know, with all what is happening uh, this last weekend, so I think it's it's a really nice thing that I'm enjoying quite a lot. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, the Argentinians are one of the best <laughs> in South Americans. They are <laughs> it's crazy the, the amount of support and uh, you know how much they push their their athletes. The uh, the South Americans in general are <laughs> extremely vocal yeah. with their support. Right, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> there is a big, big fight from uh, Bra- Brazilians and Argentinians. Uh, uh, it's a it's a tough one there. Well, <laughs> maybe you and Kyle Collette can have a few on track battles and uh, see how, how social media explodes yeah, yeah, if yeah. you two take the podium. This next question comes from Al and wants to know how does it feel to represent Argentina. And the next part of the question is curious, and I think you need to tell all three of us what this means. And drive with the number 29 in brackets, Dia de los Nuokis. I might be mispronouncing that. What? Hang on. Tell me again the last one. It says to drive with the number 29, Dia de los yeah. Nuokis, which I think was a food from what I quickly looked at. From a quick ah, food. yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dia de los Nuokis. So the gnocchi is like, yeah, it's quite also, yeah, it's kind of a pasta only. I think they eat it a lot in in Italy as well. But so basically, the twenty nine of the, is the the day in the month. The mm-hmm. number twenty nine is the day that you always have for lunch 
it's like a tradition only. You always have gnocchis for lunch. So it's like kind of a familiar thing, you know. Uh, every 29 is a day to, to make the gnocchis in family. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it, you know, with things that you miss from your country when you're, when you're from so far. Right? But it's it's so things that you, you always kind of miss. Uh, and the gnocchis that your mom was doing or your grandma, you know, a few years ago. Uh, yeah, it's just really nice to to remember that. And this is yeah. this is a, the normal pasta gnocchi that the three of us will yeah. know in Europe. Jim, Jim, you look so confused then, and I was just like, it's a it, pretty common food. It's, no, no, not the yeah, gnocchi element, but they have it so every common. every month on the 29th. And I'm like, <laughs> exactly, it's like an exact date that I mean, most of the people, not everyone, but it's like the 29th we will have gnocchi. Uh, it's like save that date of the month to <laughs> to have it. So. <laughs> fascinating insight anything from you Yuri, actually is there any sort of estonian monthly tradition to have food oh uh, we're not the most traditional people i think but uh, <laughs> no. No. No, no no knockers on the 29th i was uh, I, I found yeah. it uh, fascinating actually actually big tradition of argentina is the asado i don't know if you know it's like they are really good at barbecues in argentina so Every Sunday in family, they're doing massive asados. That is like a big barbecue with really nice meat. Uh, you know, they make their own fire and, and stuff, and they are really, really good at cooking the meat. So uh, they are so good at that since many years. It's like the place where everyone goes to have the the mega asado. And ah. It's also a nice tradition there. Well, it was notable that. There was a lot of Red Bull questions targeted at Yuri, but there's a lot of food questions targeted at you, Franco. Which yeah. I was, uh, I was quite, you know, it's notable. And the next one follows on to this. And again, I think some translation might need to come through because I, I really like learning this stuff. This one comes from Chica's GP. Pasta frollo di batata, o mem or membrillo, membrillo. Yeah. Membrillo, it's a, as you know, they also have quite a few things that they, they bear, but it's not really common in Europe, honestly. Uh, so some sweet, sweet kind of things, you know, you can have with a toast or something like this in the morning. Uh, I, I don't really have these kind of things, but in Argentina it's quite normal. Uh, I don't really know exactly, exactly of what it is because I normally don't have it, but it's really common there. Uh, it's kind of a sweet uh, sweet stuff that they have. They make it with uh, some sweet potato, and it's, I don't like it a lot, but it's really normal in Argentina. And then on the final side of this, which is a bit more standard, I might not ask all three of you this, but this goes, let's go to you first, uh, Franco. Please rate garlic bread on a scale of 0 to 10. Uh, I would rate it at six because of the smell that then you have. Uh, I really like it. I, I can enjoy it, but not if you are with a girl, I would say. You are a bit worried afterwards. But <laughs> <laughs> Yuri, garlic bread, not to ten. Yeah, I agree that it depends a bit on the situation, but uh, <laughs> if you're all on your own, it's a nice ten out of ten for me. And if you have a girlfriend? Like uh but yeah, then maybe we'll go for a five or six. The effect after is not good. Tyler, you were shaking your head furiously there. What's what's up with these guys? I mean, to be fair, I think Frank made a good point about the, yeah, if, you, if you're with someone in a close-up environment, you don't want to be breathing garlic on them. It's a fair point. But at the same point, a garlic bread, I mean, for me, it's like, I love garlic bread because have it before, if you're having like chili con carne, for example, have, have some garlic bread before that. Or is it, it's just a nice starter, really. It's just it's just something nice yeah. to have. But I, it's a good point. I mean, yeah, if you're going on the, if you're going on a flight with Helmut Marco, don't eat garlic bread before. Anyone anyone important, but yeah. Well, we've certainly gone into the part of the F1 feed uh, series podcast where we talk about food. So, yeah, I can't believe we've actually gone down that route. Uh, 
go back on topic and considering you still here, Yuri, I want you to answer this as well, if you would be so kind. This one comes from Euro F3 2018 Trufa via Discord. Even in a spec series, not all cars are equal. How do you adapt your driving style when you're up against cars that are fundamentally faster than your own? Yuri first, and then Franco. Well, whatever car you have going on to a session, you just trying to get the maximum out of it. Like, it, obviously, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's not always that you have the best car, or, you know, sometimes it's quite rare to have the best car. Um, but, you know... Uh, whatever whatever you have underneath you, you're trying to get the best out of it. It doesn't matter. You don't think about what everyone else has. Franco, you certainly, either your tyres were going off or you had some much faster cars around you, which you kind of suggested was the case. How did you find defending from these cars who you just didn't have the pace on? Well, no, I mean, definitely agree with uh, with Jury. Uh, you try to take the maximum out of, your, out of what you have uh, and just maximize your package uh, of course it's difficult when you have faster cars around but you just have to try to focus in in your job that is driving uh, your car the fastest you can arrive around the track uh, so yeah i think uh, more or less same than jury uh, i would say uh, i mean you never have the great the best the best car and even more in these championships that we are right now uh, you only have three push laps before you are going to quali, so you cannot adjust too much your balance. You cannot change too much the car that you have, and you are going to be a bit surprised in quali because of the truck is changing a lot. So the car is changing every session, I would say, quite a lot compared to what you had before. So it's quite shocking, you know, to, to go to your first push lap and, and feel like, oh, this is not the balance I wanted, but just try to put in your mind that, I mean, I have to drive this as fast as I can and try to adapt to the conditions that you have there um, and keep the, keep, keep the performance up. We're going to go for the final question now to you, Franco. And this one comes from GP46. Um, you've already spoken about representing Argentina, but they wanted to know if you have any advice for Argentinian kids who dream of getting to where you are. <laughs> well, I would say to found that Jamie and Maria, you know, are my, my managers since a few years ago, and they are helping me uh, so much in my career. Uh, I mean, I don't really have any budget, so it's quite difficult for me to get to where we are right now. And to have all the opportunities I got in the last few years in LMP2, in many cars, many, many fast cars I've been driven, um, it's I mean, a part of, of having good results and stuff, but it's for all the effort that they have been putting these last few seasons in in taking me as, as high as we can. Uh, so, yeah, I would say, of course, you need to, to, start, uh, to start early, to start at an early age. And from Argentina, I would say it's getting more and more difficult because, you know, the situation there is not very good. Uh, but you always have to keep pushing, keep pushing for your, for your dreams, keep pushing for what you want in, your, in life. And it's what I'm doing right now. And, you know, with the right help, with the right people, with, with the right people next to you, it's much more easy. Uh, uh, if you go through, 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 the right, uh, through the right way, it's much more easy. And, and I think you can make it. Uh, yeah, I think you just have to be in the right, in the right place in the right moment for me. It looks like Franco and Yuri, you're in the right places. So we both wish you well for the season ahead. Uh, we expect to see you on the top step of the podium and potentially challenging for championships. So we'll catch up with you at another time. For anybody who's still here, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you for watching and listening. If you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode, use the hashtag, hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter. Drop any questions below if you're watching on YouTube or let us know what questions you have on your mind on our Discord. Look for the podcast questions channel. If you are watching on YouTube, dropping a like on the video, leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us. And if you're listening, leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated. Finally, check out f1feederseries.com for more feeder series insight, including the writings from Tyler Foster, and follow F1 Feeder Series 1, F1 FS Americas, and F1 FS Live on Twitter. 
You can find the links to all of those, plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everyone else on the podcast in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the F1 Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye.